This is our third OAR book talk of the uh, semester, uh, featuring Radley Balco and his 2013 book, Rise of the Warrior Cop, The Militarization of America's Police Forces. I'm Dan Stageman, I'm the Director of Research Operations at the college, uh, and our office runs these events. However, I'm gonna turn the mic over to Law and Police Sciences Professor Peter Moskos, who's gonna provide Mr. Balco's formal introduction. Professor Mosco. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm very excited to be here and to um, finally uh, meet in person a man whose work I've been reading for a decade at least. Um, Radley Balco has many accolades to his name. Um, the sort of background is, is in journalism. Um, his home base now is Nashville, Tennessee. <clears throat> Um, and he's written for, uh, he runs The Watch, which is a Washington Post blog that is uh, certainly worth watching, I guess. Um, but before that, um, he, he wor published for such places like Reason Magazine and worked for the Cato Institute um, and, and had a frequent column uh, in, in the Huffington Post. Um, and he testified before Congress um, and has really been influential in this field. And what I want to emphasize, um, which is, a line that was uh, when he was awarded Journalist of the Year in 2011, um, the LA Press Club wrote that Radley Balco is one of those throwback journalists that understands the power of groundbreaking reporting and how to make a significant impact through his work. Time and time again, his stories cause readers to stop, think, and more significantly, take action. My only quibble with that, perhaps, is the last part, and I wonder, uh, certainly his work has made me stop and think, um, often critically, because I think in some ways we, we've, we've disagreed um, on certain matters of police related, but it has, never, it has never made me question my respect for his intellectual integrity and for his, his, his highlighting certain issues. But I question about this take action part, and it goes well with the John Jay College of Criminal Justice's, Justice's general theme of justice, um, because Radley Balco has been ahead of the curve. Uh, he wrote a report for the Cato Institute in 2006. He started working on it before that about the militarization of police. Um, I was certainly slightly aware of this in the background given my interest in the field, uh, but that report was in many ways groundbreaking um, because of its excellent journalism, because of the facts it came out, and because of the excellent way in which Balco presents his findings. Um, it was news to a lot of people, and it had a certain amount of impact, and then, dare I say, um, nothing happened. Um, it was a red flag that has been, the militarization of police has been a red flag that has been rising above the police um, for decades now. And Balco is really the first person to say, um, is it, did we ask for this? How is this happening? Is this something we want? Um, because police are, at their core, a civilian organization. Um, they're not the military. Police are not soldiers. The job of police is to prevent crime. The job of police is also to apprehend offenders. But this gradual shift that was happening, uh, the militarization of police, was by and large happening under the radar. Um, and Radley Balco stood high on a mountaintop, or at least at the highest hill he could find, and was shouting. Um, and a few of us were listening, and a few of us were worried. Um, but I don't think it hit home to a lot of people until the events of Ferguson. Uh, when suddenly you saw protesters being faced by a line of black clothed, baklavad, people that sure look like soldiers. And I think the, 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 the one iconic image, at least from the militarization of police, was a large turreted gun on top of an armored personnel carrier. Um, my thought was, what are you planning to do with that? Because there's no situation possible here in which you would use it. So why is there a police officer sitting behind a gun in the turret of an armored personnel carrier facing down American citizens? Um, this shocked a lot of Americans, and that's good, but it's a shame that they weren't shocked earlier because the further we go down the path of militarization, I think the harder it is to turn back the clock. Um, and I don't think anybody here is for the uh, is saying that there are times when police need a more military approach. Certainly that happens. Um, but again in Ferguson, you saw incendiary devices, flash bang grenades. Um, that goes back to the very first SWAT raid ever, which I believe Radley will talk about a bit. Um, 
being thrown in crowds of people. I have never heard tactically why you would want to throw a weapon designed to disorient and anger people into a crowd of people in the open. Um, but this is what happens when you have unchecked, unquestioned, and untransparent militarization of police. Um, so I don't think he um, timed his book for all the recent police actions. That would have been more foresight than I can give you credit for. Um, but his book did come out um, just at the perfect time as these issues uh, were hitting the forefront of, of American consciousness. Um, and I do give Balco a lot of credit for that, uh, so not because he predicted that the timing would work perfectly, because these are issues that he has cared about deeply um, over the past decade. Um, and though it's taken, I think, unfortunate events to, to bring these issues to prominence, I would also hope that by these issues being raised, um, we as, as Americans can finally um, begin to address what we want um, in, in our police departments. Uh, so with that, I um, proudly give you Radley Balco. Thank you, uh, Peter. And um, I don't know how many of you had Peter for class, but his book, Cop in the Hood, is uh, one of the four or five books I think I would recommend to anybody who wants to sort of actually see uh, what's happening to, to American policing right now. Um, it's a, a, a really highly recommended read. Um, I'm going to divert just a little bit from the militarization issue, uh, or I'm gonna, although I'm going to come back to it, and I think these issues are related, because uh, I want to get into something a little more topical. I'm going to show you a quick video clip here. I'm not going to show the whole thing. Um, but this is actually, I, I would just say this has been part of my talk for about the last uh, couple of months. Uh, it happens to be extremely timely given what's in the headlines lately. But um, I'll just let you watch here to start. Officer Glinowitz is the 22nd law enforcement officer that has been shot and killed so far this year. Wicomico County Sheriff Mike Lewis says these recent attacks highlight an alarming trend that law enforcement officers around the country are under siege. He joins us now. For so many years, for ages, the badge has always been a sign of respect, a sign of pride. It seems as though now the badge that you're wearing often becomes a target. It certainly has become a target. I just put an email out yesterday to all Wicomico County Sheriff's Office personnel to discontinue wearing anything that would affiliate them or associate them with law enforcement while off duty to protect themselves, to protect their families. Um, I've never seen it like this, Leland. It's a scary, scary time for law enforcement in this country. It truly so how many of you heard some sort of variation on this? There's a war on cop, cops are under siege, there's a, cop, a, a target on cops' backs. Um, so you've probably heard that Officer Glinowitz uh, was not killed, it came out just in the last couple of days, that he uh, committed suicide, uh, what they're describing as a, um, a carefully staged suicide, uh, apparently to... Um, uh, distracting the fact that he was embezzling uh, money for the last seven or eight years. But the fact that that particular case didn't pan out the way this particular uh, Fox News segment uh, portrayed it uh, is just an anecdote, right? That's just one case. Uh, but if we look at the broader trend, uh, policing has been getting progressively safer for the last 20 to 25 years. Uh, and in fact, this year is on pace to be the second safest year for police officers basically since we've been keeping record, particularly if you look at rates uh, as opposed to overall figures. I'm going to show you some figures here. Um, so this is the, the raw number of police officers feloniously killed in the line of duty since 1961. Uh, as you can see, we are, uh, this goes up through 2013. Uh, 2014, there was a slight tick upward. Um, I think there were uh, 48 maybe, I think, last year. Uh, this year, but as I said, this year we're, we're on pace to have the safest year for police since two th uh, the second safest year, uh, at least in a half century uh, after only 2013. Um, if we if we make this a rate, uh, the rate of police officers killed in the line of duty, uh, the trend becomes even more pronounced. This is a little bit tricky because there are varying estimates on how many police officers there actually are. It depends on your definition of police. It depends on your source. Um, but this is from uh, the American Enterprise Institute uh, taking various numbers, and you can see the different uh, graphs uh, based on which estimate on total number of police officers you use, but all of them are in, heading in a downward uh, direction and have been basically since about the mid-1990s. If you average the figures, it looks like this. Uh, now, the response to this is commonly, well, maybe fewer police officers are getting killed in the line of duty, 
Uh, but that's because we have better, they have better armor, uh, they have better training. They're using lethal force more often, so they're killing the bad guys before the bad guys can kill them. Uh, but this doesn't hold up either. Uh, oh, actually, let me look. Here's this, this chart is um, the five-year sort of five-year running average of felonious killings of police officers in the line of duty. And as you can see, uh, the most recent period for which we have, uh, for which this has been figured uh, from the FBI data, uh, again, it's a solid sort of downward trend. Um, but the body armor and sort of more, more training and, and uh, quicker shooting uh, argument fails also because assaults on police officers are also dropping dramatically. So it isn't just that body armor is protecting police officers from the bad guys, uh, it's that uh, fewer people are attacking police officers. Um, this is good news. Uh, this is great news, really. It's something that should be celebrated. Um, we are giving police officers more scrutiny um, they're getting, they're, they're more likely to be sort of held accountable or although, you know, a, a lot of people would say they aren't held accountable clearly enough when it comes to uh, egregious misconduct. Um, but all of that criticism is not manifesting as violence against police officers. It's actually getting safer and safer and safer to be a police officer. This is, again, this is something we should, be, we, should, we should be celebrating. It's something that we should be telling cops that, hey, your job is getting safer. Instead, we're doing the opposite. Uh, we're telling them that their job is getting more dangerous, that they're working in war zones, that it's never been more dangerous to be a police officer. And what that does uh, is it puts police officers on edge. Uh, it makes them uh, sort of more uh, prone to use force more quickly, more prone to use lethal force more quickly. When you tell someone over and over and over again that they're under siege, that they're under attack, uh, that they're, you know, they're, um, uh, their beat is their sector and their career is their tour of duty, uh, it instills a very sort of militaristic kind of battlefield mindset, uh, and it makes things much more volatile. Uh, it makes it much less like, me makes an, a de-escalation of force much more likely and an escalation much, uh, uh, excuse me, de-escalation much less likely and an escalation much more likely. Um, this is a quote from just a couple of uh, months ago, and again, this is the president of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. You can see, we're telling our people from time to time, you put on a uniform, uh, from the time you walk into your house, your head needs to be on a swivel, there's no downtime anymore, no lunch, no relaxing for a few minutes. Basically, always be on guard all the time because someone's always trying to kill you. Um, now, this isn't just bad for the communities that police officers serve, this is bad for police officers themselves. Uh, you know, imagine a job where uh, you're told every day that every interaction with a citizen could be your last, uh, that it'll be a struggle for you just to get home, you know, safely to your kids at night. Uh, you can see how this is going to put a lot of officers on edge uh, and how they're going to sort of think much more primitively, uh, be much less likely to sort of uh, try to de-escalate potentially dangerous situations. Um, this is a problem. It's a problem for communities, and I said it's a problem for police. When you compound that, and, and I don't think uh, police critics uh, sort of I think there's a strong argument to be made sort of from the from a kind of an empathetic perspective of police officers as to why this trend in policing is bad. And I think one of them is is this, that it makes things more dangerous for officers as well. Uh, but also reactionary policing, this idea that you're sort of driving around in your squad car and you're really only getting out and interacting with the community when there's conflict uh, or when someone's under suspicion. That's a really miserable work experience, right? If your only interactions with other human beings over the course of the workday are negative uh, and, and, and some sort of conflict, uh, again, that makes it a very, very difficult job. And I think we are seeing uh, police, policing uh, law enforcement has become sort of this very psychological, psychologically isolated profession. Uh, police officers have a very tight sort of bond, tighter even in the military. Uh, you see this over and over again, sort of there's, th there's cops and the families of cops and there's everybody else. Uh, and I think this is a very sort of unhealthy trend. Now, I said this is a bit of a diversion, but I think it's, it's not a diversion. I, mean, I think this is a product of police militarization. Uh, it goes hand in hand with it. And I think the mindset, we talk, it's very easy, and I'm going to show you a lot of scary pictures of military equipment that police are using. Uh, and it's very easy to sort of recoil at the sight of, you know, the, the big guns and the snipers and the tanks and the helicopters. Uh, but the mindset problem, I think, is every bit uh, as troubling and every bit as concerning as the, the equipment itself. Uh, I think we're, you know, in addition to arming police as if they're soldiers, um, we're telling them basically to think that they're soldiers, and that's just as problematic. Um, so let me sort of get into the meat of the talk here, and I'm going to show you another video. Um, let me set this up real quick. 
This is a raid in Columbia, Missouri in 2011. Um, the probable cause for this raid, the police got an anonymous tip from a neighbor that there was uh, marijuana activity going on in this house. Um, they did a trash pull, uh, went to the family's trash, they found what they called seeds and stems, and that's it. That's the probable cause they had for, for the actions that you're about to see in this video. Um, they didn't uh, do a controlled buy, they didn't send an informant to try to buy drugs, uh, they didn't do any surveillance. Uh, basically, they got the tip, uh, they went and through the trash, they found the seeds and stems, and this happened next. I should warn you, you're gonna hear but not see a dog getting shot, so if you're a dog person, it's gonna be a little disturbing. I encourage you to imagine you're asleep in a back bedroom in the house. Count the number of seconds between the first announcement and the first gunshot. Columbia Police, search warrant! Columbia Police, search warrant! There's the first gunshot. I'm gonna see a seven-year-old get shuffled out of the house here in a minute. They, they weren't aware that there was a child in the house. Need one, need one, need one. I need one! Slow it down! Get past him, get past him. Move! Move past him! Move past him! Come on, guys, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. So make sure we're Stay around there, boy. Come on, you're not going Don't move, you understand? Put your hands behind your back, do it now. Behind your back! I'm with you. So, the police found a small quantity of pot in the bedroom, a personal use amount. Uh, as it turns out, pot had been decriminalized in the city of Columbia. Uh, so the way the drug laws work, um, they couldn't charge the guy for the pot. They had to find a pipe near the pot. If the pipe had been anywhere else in the house, it would have been legal. But because it was found near the pot that they couldn't charge him for, they could charge him uh, with possession of drug paraphernalia. So we got a $250 fine. That was the result of the raid. Um, when this raid, when the video came out, I posted it on the Reason website. Uh, it quickly went viral. I think it had close to two million YouTube views within a week. Uh, and it made international news. The reaction, I thought, was pretty fascinating. Um, this, uh, it made, as I said, it made international news. The Columbia Police Department uh, was overwhelmed with email and phone calls. They ended up having to shut down their, their phone lines and their email for a while. Um, there was my favorite segment about this video was on Fox News. Uh, Bill O'Reilly uh, was on, and he brought on the noted uh, police militarization expert Charles Krauthammer. Uh, that's a joke uh, to talk about the uh, the raid. And Krauthammer said something interesting. He said uh, he said, "Don't judge the drug war by what you see in this video. Uh, th these cops are rogue cops. Uh, you know, this is way outside the norm. This isn't this isn't how you know we fight the drug war in America." And he was a hundred percent wrong. Uh, this, the, this raid was, was very typical uh, from the relatively light probable cause, to the fact that it was done at night, the shooting of the dog, the fact that they didn't know there was a kid inside, uh, the relatively little contraband that was found. Uh, none of those things are particularly unusual. In fact, the only really unusual thing about this raid uh, is that it was recorded and that the video was released to the public. But the reaction uh, was interesting. I'd been covering this issue for about five or six years at the time. Uh, and people were angry by what they saw in the video. Some too angry. The Columbia Police Department also got a lot of death threats. Um, but it was almost as if uh, kind of the internet generation was seeing for the first time how the drug wars actually fought on the ground. Uh, and they were pretty angry at what they saw. Um, what you saw in this video, that video and what you'll see in this next video happens uh, about 150, 180 times a day in the United States. Um, the vast majority of these raids are done like that one. Uh, although, you know, there are variations. Some are done during the day. Sometimes uh, there are no-knock raids. That was a knock and announce. although, you know, I would argue from the perspective of someone to sleep inside, there's really not much difference. Um, but 150, 180 times a day, this happens in the United States. The vast majority of those, about 75 to 80 percent from the data that we have, uh, are done to serve warrants on people suspected of drug crimes, and the majority of those are for pot. Um, I'll show you another video. This one's a little more disturbing. 
<clears throat> uh, this was in Utah. Uh, this was a raid on someone. The, the police suspected that there was somebody dealing meth from this uh, house. Uh, the guy that you're going to see an actual person get shot and killed in this video, uh, his name is Todd Blair. Uh, he's not the suspect the police were after. They were actually after his, his roommate. You're going to see him come out of the bedroom wielding a golf club. Uh, the police claim that this gave them justification to kill him. I would argue that if a guy comes out of a, a bedroom carrying a golf club in response to a SWAT raid, he probably you know, didn't know that this was a SWAT team, right? Uh, he was probably taken by surprise, which is sort of the whole point of these tactics in the first place. Um, so I'll show you this one real quick. This one's a little shorter. So that raid was deemed justified. Also, um, about three months after that raid, the same uh, task force called the Weber Morgan County Narcotic, Narcotics Strike Force, um, Strike Force, by the way, I mean, the, the names are, are, are telling. Um, this, this particular unit actually had an, uh, an ad they took out on buses uh, in Ogden, Utah, uh, where they were all wearing camouflage and full face masks hiding their faces, and they were sort of standing, holding their guns, pointing them out from, from the bus. Uh, and it said, please report any drug use, uh, we'll have your back. Uh, so again, even their advertisements were not even aimed at sort of drug dealers, they were asking for tips on people who just used drugs. But about, anyway, a few months after this particular raid, the same task force uh, staged a very similar raid on a guy named Matthew David Stewart. Um, their evidence for this raid was a tip from an ex-girlfriend that Stewart was growing pot in his basement. Uh, and actually it was. Uh, Stewart was an Iraq uh, war veteran, uh, suffered from PTSD. Uh, and according to his family, a smoke pot to self-medicate. Um, you can, you know, believe that or not. Uh, but there was no evidence at all that he was actually selling. Uh, there were no complaints from neighbors. There was no controlled buy. Again, they broke into his house uh, at, uh, after sundown. Stewart had a gun next to the bed. He grabbed it. Depending on who he believed, either he or the cops started firing first. But there was a full-fledged gunfight. Uh, they ended with one cop uh, dead, two critically injured, and Stewart critically injured. Uh, Stewart was charged with capital murder, the intentional killing of a police officer from his hospital bed. Uh, when he recovered, uh, they put him in a prison cell, and uh, about a year after the raid, uh, he lost a pretty important hearing in his case. He was trying to argue that the, the search warrant was illegal because there was not enough evidence uh, for this type of raid. He lost that uh, hearing, uh, and the next morning, uh, the, the guards found him hanging in his jail cell. So you have two dead now uh, because of this sort of decision to go in, uh, sort of guns blazing uh, in the middle of the night for basically a guy growing pot in his basement. <clears throat> so how do we get here? How do we get to the point where these, this kind of thing is happening 150, 180 times per day? Um, this is an old Cold War quote. It's uh, commonly attributed to Winston Churchill, although I should admit I can't find proof he actually said it. Um, but it is sort of a, captures kind of a sentiment, you know, at the time that this is what separates us from, you know, the Iron Curtain countries, right? In free societies and democracies, uh, the government doesn't send armed men in black to your door in the middle of the night. Um, I would submit that not only have we gotten quite a far away from that general idea, uh, even the knocking uh, at this point is optional, given the, the ubiquity of the no-knock raid. Um, so a lot of you may have heard this term. Uh, it's commonly sort of misunderstood, or at least the, the original application of it is a little bit misunderstood. Uh, but posse comitatus is generally kind of the idea that uh, in free societies, we keep a very sort of firm wall uh, between the military uh, and the police. Uh, and there's a very good reason for this, right? Uh, the military's job uh, is very specific. Uh, it's to annihilate a foreign enemy, uh, to kill people and break things. Uh, this is what the military is supposed to do. Um, although there's a good argument that the military does a lot of policing itself lately. Um, police are to protect our rights. Uh, their job is, as the LAPD motto famously said, to protect and serve. 
Uh, these are two fundamentally different missions, two fundamentally different functions. Uh, it's very dangerous to, to conflate the two. Uh, Norm Stamper, the old Seattle police chief who I interviewed for, the, for my book, put it a different way, but also I think pretty eloquently. He said, a soldier's job is to follow orders, a police officer's job is to make decisions. Again, two very, very different jobs. Um, but unfortunately, because both jobs involve carrying a gun uh, and using force, uh, I think a lot of sort of politicians and policymakers think that the, the skill sets are kind of interchangeable. Uh, and you see this both sort of with the use of war and martial rhetoric when uh, policymakers and politicians and other elected leaders are referring to police. Uh, but you also see it in things like Clinton's Troops to Cops program, right? Uh, which was very well intentioned and I'm sure benefited a lot of people. And I, no one would argue, I think, that soldiers, there's something, soldiers should not be cops under any circumstances. But it did sort of re rely on this kind of assumption that, hey, if you're good at soldiering, you're probably good at policing too. Uh, and I think that's a false assumption for a lot of reasons. Um, I'll get to this in a minute, but there's actually, <laughs> there's actually, I, I've actually heard the argument fairly persuasively that uh, soldiers may actually make better police officers than police officers today, given the way the military sort of trains them. Um, throughout our country's history, we've done a pretty good job of keeping the military out of domestic law enforcement. Um, there have been a few exceptions during sort of insurrections and riots and uprisings, but for the most part, uh, those exceptions were very brief. Uh, and the military sort of returned to its, its stated function. Uh, the one exception where the military was used sort of in day-to-day -day policing over an extended period of time uh, would be Reconstruction when the Union Army was basically running the former Confederate states for, I guess, over a decade. Um, now, I'd argue that was a legitimate use of the military uh, in that particular instance, uh, but that was also a very uh, extraordinary circumstance and hopefully a you know, once in our country's history sort of circumstance. Um, otherwise, we've done a pretty good job, as I said, of keeping the military out of domestic law enforcement. Uh, in the 1980s, there was a move by both parties, actually, uh, to bring the military in to fight the drug war. They wanted Marines marching up and down streets conducting drug raids and arrests. They wanted navies, the Navy intercepting ships. Um, and it was pushed by the Reagan administration, but there were certainly lots of Democratic leaders that wanted this as well. Uh, and I think this is a, a healthy thing. Uh, the reason why this is one of the few really terrible drug war ideas in the 80s that didn't get passed into law uh, was due to opposition from the military itself. Uh, and this is testimony from Thomas Olstead in, uh, I believe it was 1986. Uh, he was the number three man at the Pentagon at the time. Uh, and it was really his testimony that convinced Congress that this was a bad road to go down. <clears throat> So we're going to, to illustrate kind of the point of how close cops and soldiers have become, or how much cops have come to resemble soldiers, we're going to play a little game called Cop or Soldier. Uh, I'm going to show you a photo, uh, and you're going to tell me if this is a police officer uh, or a member of the military. Uh, all these photos are either members of the military, uh, US military, or domestic police officers. So here, right, very, very famous photo from Ferguson. Uh, this guy was unarmed. Um, the thing about Ferguson that was really interesting is when these images started to come out, as, uh, as Professor Moscos pointed out, not only did it really kind of trigger a national discussion about this issue that was long overdue, uh, it also triggered a lot of outrage from members of the military themselves. Uh, I did a lot of cable TV shows around Ferguson, um, I was on social media a lot, uh, and you saw a number of complaints from people in the military as these images were coming out. One, uh, there was actually a complaint uh, widely sort of echoed uh, that in Iraq and Afghanistan, they weren't nearly as well equipped and armed as some of these cops that they were seeing in Ferguson. Um, the other is that in the military, you are taught very strict gun discipline. Uh, you're taught over, it's sort of drummed in your head in the military that you don't point your gun at anything you don't intend to destroy. Uh, and we saw over and over and over again in Ferguson, police officers pointing their guns at unarmed uh, peaceful protesters. Now, this of course is not to say there wasn't any violence uh, during that period. Uh, there was, uh, but, there were, but you know, you don't point your gun until the violence happens. Uh, and uh, several of the police chiefs I interviewed actually for the book who, you know, I think take a sort of very forward thinking approach to this, uh, talk a lot about protests and how if you come to a protest expecting violence and confrontation, you're going to get violence and confrontation. It becomes very self-fulfilling. Um, the way to handle protest, uh, Chief Jerry Wilson, who was the police chief in Washington, D.C. in the 70s, said, uh, where, where there was actually very little violence and unrest while there was a lot going on around the country. There were protests, but they never sort of erupted into violence. He, would all, he said he would 
have his police officers show up in their blue uniforms at a protest. Um, they would have faces, they'd have name tags, right? Uh, they weren't these sort of masked uh, kind of robocops confronting the protesters. Now, he said you'd have to have your riot team on hand in case things got out of hand, but he would put them on a bus and he'd park the bus a couple streets over so that they were out of view. Uh, because in his experience, again, when you show up expecting violence, uh, violence becomes inevitable. And I think that's what we saw in Ferguson. Um, so, copper soldier, right, still, still these are all going to be cops. Um, <laughs> uh, again, this is from Ferguson. This is the uh, Michigan State Police. Uh, they, they posted this to Twitter and got a, a retweet from the governor of Michigan, and then I wrote a piece in the Washington Post about it, and they took it down. Um, but, you know, why you need Geely suits and the full, full camouflage. I mean, the camouflage is a thing that always has kind of perplexed me, right? There's really no reason for police to wear camouflage. Um, one, there are very few instances where police are trying to hide. Two, if they are, right, they're not raiding the woods, right? They're, they're raiding houses or they're working in cities. Um, the only reason you wear camouflage, there are two reasons. One is to sort of mimic the military and sort of try to be more like the military. And the other, and, and I think that the two kind of go together, is that you're getting the stuff from the military. And that tends to be what uh, is happening in a lot of these cases, although certainly not all of them. Um, let's see, this was the response to a uh, abortion rights protest in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, this was a raid in Iowa on a guy who was suspected of uh, credit card fraud. Um, the uh, justification for this kind of force, the police said, was that the guy, not even the suspect, but the guy's roommate, uh, had a uh, concealed carry permit with the state of Iowa. Now think about that for a minute. Um, if the guy took, went to the trouble to register his gun with the government, uh, odds are he's probably not going to be a threat to kill police officers, unless you take him by surprise and he doesn't know they're police officers, right? Um, it was, it, there, but this is not the only raid that's, been, that's going down this way, but the police have later said the fact that someone had a registered gun was their, their justification for sort of coming, coming in with the SWAT team, and it just doesn't make any sense. It actually makes things quite a bit more dangerous. Um, <clears throat> this is a SWAT team in Maine. This is an Oregon State trooper. Um, so as you see, I mean, the, the, the point here is that uh, it's becoming increasingly difficult to, uh, to distinguish them. I do have a quiz that there are actual members of the military mixed in, you know, to, but, um, oh, uh, this is another, this is a raid on a uh, massage parlor in Alabama where the police suspected the women were giving more than massages. Uh, again, why you have to cover your face and sort of dress up in the full fatigues and carry the gun uh, for these uh, slight sort of women who were giving extras after the massage, uh, I'm not really sure about. So let's talk a little bit more about how we got here. Um, this is a cop, by the way. Um, so, so there are two trends that kind of got us here. One is the rise of the SWAT team, and the other is the rise of the drug war. Uh, I'm going to talk about both of them very quickly. Um, rise of the SWAT team. The SWAT team is basically the brainchild of this guy. This is Daryl Gates. Um, will go on to become the uh, uh, longtime police chief in Los Angeles. Uh, Gates in mid-1960s was the, uh, an inspector at LAPD, and he was in charge of LAPD's response to the Watts riots. The Watts riots were a little bit different than any riots we had seen up, to, up until that point. Um, there was no sort of single precipitating incident that uh, instigated the riots. Uh, I mean, there was. There was a, a traffic stop. But it was more the product of basically a generation of animosity that had been built up between communities of color in Los Angeles and the administration of uh, Chief William Parker. Um, so it wasn't a single issue, you know, that, that, that you know, the city officials could address that would have diminished the anger. Um, the other thing is the riots, from Gates' perspective, were particularly sort of uh, vicious. Uh, rioters would shoot at paramedics when they came to treat people who had been wounded. Uh, they would shoot at firefighters when they came to put out fires. Uh, and for Gates, this, this was he thought this was particularly scary because uh, he didn't think that U.S. police forces had... Uh, the capability to respond to these kinds of emergency situations. Um, there had also been a couple of uh, active shooter situations. There was uh, Charles Whitman at the University of Texas. Uh, there was also another uh, active shooter uh, that uh, had held up in his house for several hours with the LAPD because the LAPD didn't have weapons that were powerful enough to sort of reach the house. So Gates thought, well, the Watts riots were to him sort of a kind of urban guerrilla warfare. So the LAPD needed a response that was as sort of overwhelming and powerful. Uh, so he consulted with some Marines at Camp Pendleton nearby and came up with the idea of this very elite, highly trained police unit that could sort of swoop in in violent situations, 
and use overwhelming force and violence to defuse them as quickly as possible. Um, so he calls out the SWAT team. Uh, the moniker initially stood for special weapons assault teams. Somebody at LAPD, uh, I'm guessing their communications office, told him you probably shouldn't have the word assault in the name. Uh, so they changed it to special weapons and tactics. Um, interestingly, he brings this idea to William Parker, uh, and Parker shoots him down. Uh, Parker says, no, he says this comes too close to breaching this traditional wall between the police and the military. Uh, Parker dies about a year and a half later, uh, and Gates takes the idea to Chief William Redden, who gives him the green light, and now we have our first SWAT team. Uh, the first SWAT raid uh, was in 1968 on a Black Panther holdout in Los Angeles. Um, the Black Panthers were, uh, you know, obviously a political organization, uh, but they were a little different than this sort of phantom menace that Fox News tries to scare you about today. Um, you know, the Black Panthers in the 1960s did have a body count. Uh, they had gotten into several uh, gunfights with police officers. And so from the public's perspective, um, from the white public's perspective in particular, uh, this SWAT raid on a Black Panther compound looked like these heroic cops sort of confronting this group that they were afraid of. Uh, logistically, the raid was kind of a disaster. Um, they were actually lucky that the entire SWAT team wasn't killed. Um, real, the really interesting thing about this raid is afterward, uh, the Black Panthers who were involved in the gunfight were charged with various crimes up to and including uh, attempted murder of a police officer, uh, and they were acquitted. Every one of them was acquitted. Uh, and what they argued was that these tactics, the SWAT tactics, took them by surprise. They had no idea these were police, uh, and they were defending themselves. Uh, which, you know, I think is a perfectly <laughs> legitimate argument. Uh, it's not an argument that's going to get you very far in court today. Uh, but there was a time when these tactics were so sort of shocking uh, to people uh, that every one of the, the Black Panthers involved in the shootout w was acquitted. Um, but again, from a PR standpoint, this was a huge success for Gates. And so he gets the, the green light to continue with the SWAT team, and in fact, to form a couple more. Uh, the next kind of big moment in SWAT history uh, comes in, uh, I believe, 1973. Uh, with a raid on the Symbionese Liberation Army holdout in Los Angeles. Um, the SLA was a domestic terror organization. Uh, they had kidnapped Patty Hearst, uh, the newspaper heiress, uh, and the whole country was kind of following where this was going to go. Uh, they had allegedly brainwashed her. She was caught on security video helping rob, a, I believe it was a sporting goods store. I'm sorry? Oh, it was a Wells Fargo bank. Um, and so when the FBI and LAPD announced that they had cornered the SLA in this townhouse in Los Angeles, there were national news crews that were sort of ready to go. Uh, and so you had this now this nationally televised raid. Uh, and again, logistically, it was kind of a disaster. The, um, uh, the police ended up burning to the ground, killing everyone inside. Uh, but again, no LAPD officers were killed, no citizens other than SLA members were killed. And so from the public's perspective, again, this was a huge success, right? This was. Uh, these cops confronting this group that a lot of people were legitimately and understandably afraid of. And this really vaults the SWAT idea into the pop culture. Um, so soon we get uh, a SWAT, Aaron Spelling, produces, Aaron Spelling produces a SWAT TV show, becomes the number one show in the country in 1975. We get SWAT board games and lunch boxes and Viewmaster sets, uh, little SWAT die cast SWAT mobiles that your you know, son can use to raid his sister's dollhouse. Um, so, in 1970, we have one SWAT team. By 1975, there are about 500. Um, so basically, every you know, decent-sized city in the country has one. But for the most part, uh, SWAT is reserved for these emergency-type situations where you're using overwhelming force and violence to defuse an already violent scenario. So think active shooters, hostage takings, bank robberies, uh, escaped fugitives. Um, they're being used to confront people who are in the process of committing a violent crime, right? You're trying to save lives. Uh, so let's talk about the drug war. About the same time, uh, you have the drug war starting up, and I think you can kind of trace the modern drug war to the 1968 presidential election, um, where um, the homicide rate is soaring, you've got overdose deaths are soaring, there are riots on TV fairly frequently, and so Nixon runs this very cynical campaign uh, of making sort of crime the centerpiece of his platform. Um, if you want to be cynical, particularly cynical and probably accurate, uh, the goal of the campaign was to make white people afraid of black crime. Um, Nixon comes up with a number of really, really awful ideas as part of this platform, uh, and, but one of them I want to talk about for the purposes of, of this discussion uh, is the no-knock raid. So 
up until 1968, the no-knock raid um, was not a policy. Uh, no-knock raids happened, but they happened because the police would get a search warrant, they would show up to the scene, uh, they would maybe hear somebody you know, getting beaten inside, maybe they would see somebody reaching for a gun inside, they would decide they, they, can't, you know, they, they can't knock and announce, they have to go in immediately, uh, and then afterwards they would have to justify their actions uh, to a judge. Um, the very sort of idea of the no-knock raid, of breaking into somebody's house without knocking, announcing first, really violates uh, about five or six centuries of case law going back to England. Uh, it violates this principle called the Castle Doctrine, which today is usually invoked in the, the gun control debate, but has a very broader meaning, which is that the home should be a place of peace and sanctuary, uh, that the government, uh, the king shouldn't be able to send his men into your home uh, except under the most extreme circumstances, and even then, uh, they should have to announce themselves and their purpose to give you a chance to come to the door and let them in peacefully and avoid uh, violence to your person and the destruction of your property. The no knock raid dispenses with all of that. It says the drug war, the drug drugs are so such an existential threat. Uh, we have to do away with all this whole castle doctrine nonsense and give police the authority to just kick down doors uh, in order to apprehend drug offenders. Um, this was not something that police chiefs were asking for. Uh, this is not something really that organically grew out of policing at all. Uh, rather, the whole no-knock raid was the brainchild of a 28-year-old Senate staffer named Don Santarelli, uh, who was recruited to the Nixon campaign to come up with wedge issues uh, to, again, sort of make white middle-class voters fear uh, crime, in particular black crime. Uh, Santarelli is still around, interviewing for the book. He today is very uh, mournful for what he did, calls it the biggest mistake of his career. Uh, but there's no mistake about it at the time, the no-knock raid was not uh, something that the police said they needed. Uh, it was something that the politicians invented and, and then tried to convince the police that they needed. Uh, Nixon gets elected in 1970. We get two no-knock raid laws. One applies uh, just to federal narcotics agents across the country. The other applies just to Washington, D.C., uh, which you know Congress has jurisdiction over D.C., so Nixon and Maine, D.C. kind of is test city for these various policies. Uh, interestingly, uh, Jerry Wilson, who I mentioned earlier, the police chief at the time, refuses to implement the no-knock raid. He says this is too aggressive, it's too violent. Uh, and I interviewed him, as I said, I interviewed him for the book. He said, look, he said, police will give you two reasons why they have to use no-knock raids in drug investigations. The first is they'll say if we knock it announced, then the, it'll give the drug dealer time to get a gun and kill us. He said his, in his entire career, uh, he never knew drug dealers uh, to go into drug dealing to kill cops, right? They go into drug dealing to make money. Um, even the most sort of, you know, vengeful drug killer knows that if you kill a cop, uh, you're going to be lucky to survive the next couple seconds. Uh, and if you survive that, you're, you're going to be in prison for the rest of your life if you're lucky. Um, the other reason they give is that they need to get in uh, before the suspect has time to dispose of the evidence, basically flush it down the toilet. Uh, and Wilson said, well, look, uh, the whole purpose of the drug war is to get the drugs off the streets, right? Said if uh, they flush the drugs down the toilet, then the drugs are off the streets. Um, the only reason why you have to get in before they can flush the drugs is because you want to preserve the evidence in order to win a conviction. Uh, and in his estimation, uh, you know, anyone who had a small enough quantity of drugs that they could be quickly flushed down the toilet was not a big enough target to justify this extreme of a tactic. Um, Interestingly, crime goes down in D.C. over the next several years while it goes up in the rest of the country. I'm not saying refusal to implement the no-knock raid is why that happened, uh, but I am saying, you know, it's curious that uh, D.C. did not become sort of, uh, things actually got better there. Nationally, it's a very different story. Nationally, you have federal narcotics agents kicking down doors left and right. Uh, there was a very sort of aggressive uh, dehumanization campaign that came from the White House also really kind of dehumanizing drug offenders, making them seem like, uh, as um, Miles Ambrose, one of Nixon's chief drug warriors put it, the very vermin of humanity. Uh, and so there was, armed with a sort of no-knock raid, you had narcotics agents just sort of kicking down doors all over the place. They were raiding houses without warrants, raiding the wrong house. People were getting hurt, people were getting killed. Congress holds hearings. They bring some of these victims forward who testify a uh, very curious thing happens then. Uh, Congress actually repeals both of the no-knock raid bills. Um, now, the no-knock raid is going to come back in the 80s with a vengeance, and there's a huge sort of body count behind it. Uh, but there was actually a time when Congress was capable of some shame and reflection uh, and could admit that maybe they had gone too far uh, with this particular law. Um, 
So you have these two trends going on at the same time, the SWAT team, the drug war, but they're moving parallel to one another, right? These federal agents are undercover cops, right? They're in street clothes. They're not wearing SWAT gear. The SWAT teams uh, are pro proliferating, but they're being used, again, primarily in these emergency type situations where SWAT teams are appropriate. I'm not anti-SWAT team, I'm anti-abusive SWAT teams. Um, you don't really see the convergence of these two issues until the 1980s uh, when the Reagan administration takes over and really tries to make the drug war metaphor very literal. Um, and this is where you start to see SWAT teams primarily used to serve warrants on people suspected of drug crimes. Um, the Reagan administration really ramps up the rhetoric. Uh, at one point, he declared drugs a threat to US national security. Um, and they passed two laws, or Reagan sort of implements two policies that I think really drive the rise of SWAT teams and, and militarization. The first is he instructs the Pentagon to start informally giving away surplus military equipment to police departments across the country. And this policy is gonna be formalized with an office and a budget in the 1990s, but it really started in the early 80s. Um, so we're talking machine guns and tanks and helicopters and armored personnel carriers, grenade launchers. Stuff designed for use of, on a battlefield is now being given to local poli domestic police departments for use on American streets uh, and in American neighborhoods. The other thing Reagan does uh, is he creates a series of federal grants that are tied solely to drug policing, not to anything else. So if you send your cops out to arrest suspected rapist or murderer, there's no federal money tied to that. You send them out to arrest a couple of low-level drug offenders, there is federal money tied to that, and there have actually been uh, some local newspapers have done investigations and you know, were, have been able to actually put a price on each drug arrest and how much revenue that brings in. So think about how these two policies play out if you're a local sheriff or police chief, right? You get a bunch of cool stuff from the Pentagon through this program. Uh, you start a SWAT team because why not? You know, everybody else is doing it. Now you can keep your SWAT team in reserve and wait for one of these emergency sorts of situations where SWAT is appropriate, but that's probably never gonna happen in your town. Or you can start sending your SWAT team out on drug raids uh, and generate revenue for your police department, uh, both through these federal grants and also through civil asset forfeiture, which um, I'm sure most of you have heard of, but we don't have time to get into here. But SWAT becomes very lucrative, and sending SWAT teams out to serve drug warrants becomes very lucrative. Um, as I said before, Reagan really also ratchets up the rhetoric, the dehumanization, and so you get all this military gear, military tactics, then combined with this idea that you're fighting a war, that the people you're fighting against are scum, they're less than human. Uh, and you can see where you sort of set the stage for this very antagonistic uh, confrontational relationship between police uh, and the communities they serve. Uh, William Bennett, Reagan's education secretary, who later becomes our first drug czar, uh, at one point floated the idea of suspending habeas corpus for people suspected of drug crimes. Uh, another case on Larry King Live, he uh, said he would have no moral objection to beheading drug dealers on live television. Uh, Daryl Gates also becomes a very outspoken drug warrior. Uh, he, also on Larry King Live, at one point said the drug users, uh, not even drug dealers, but drug users, are guilty of treason and should be taken out in the street and shot. Uh, this is a policy he's going to walk back when his son gets arrested for drug possession. Twice. Um, but so what we've seen in the intervening years is this, this rhetoric, this war rhetoric gets perpetuated over and over and over again. It filters down to the sheriffs, to the, to the, uh, the captains, lieutenants, all the way down to the beat cop. Um, this is just one of many quotes you can find on the book, and you can find them all over uh, the newspapers just in the last few months. But again, this is a sheriff of Clayton County, Georgia, uh, a few years ago, and he's saying, note that not only is he saying we need to fight the drug war as if it were a, an actual war, uh, but it, we need to... It can't be a namby-pamby war like Vietnam. We have to fight it like we're storming the beaches of Normandy uh, and drug offenders or German soldiers. These are, by the way, these are the people who elected him, right? These are the people he's supposed to be serving. Um, but you, you get this from the politicians as well. Um, former Mayor Bloomberg, uh, I like the sound of that, um, said uh, a few years ago that NYPD was the eighth largest army in the world, right? Um, again, Seems like a fairly harmless statement, but it does sort of betray a mentality, this idea that police are soldiers fighting a war, uh, not you know, peace officers who are here to protect our rights. Um, what we see as a result of these policies is an explosion in both the number and use of SWAT teams. Peter Kraska, a criminologist uh, who's been serving uh, SWAT uh, team, or police departments about use of SWAT teams for decades, uh, it's found that in the late 70s, there were about 300 SWAT deployments per year in the United States, uh, 300 across the entire country. 
By the early 80s, we're up to about 3,000. Uh, and by 2005, we need a follow-up study. We're looking at about 50,000 uh, per year. Um, today, he estimates we're somewhere between 80 and 100,000. Given that the trends that sort of drove the initial jump, uh, the laws and the sort of the policies are still in place, that seems like a pretty reasonable estimate. Um, we'll skip over a couple of these. Um, this is the SWAT team at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Uh, this is the newest trend we're seeing where uh, colleges are now forming their own SWAT teams. The justification for this is always uh, Virginia Tech, Columbine, we have to be prepared for the next mass shooting. Um, the reality is, despite the sort of saturation of coverage we get from these shootings, uh, Dewey Cornell, a sociologist at the University of Virginia, has crunched the numbers and estimates the average uh, middle school, high school, or college can expect to see uh, a mass shooting about once every seven to 8,000 years. Uh, so the idea that every campus needs a SWAT team to prevent the next Columbine uh, is pretty absurd. Uh, unfortunately, once the SWAT team's up and running, there's plenty of drug activity on campus to keep them busy. Um, <clears throat> oh, the, the, yeah, I remember what I was gonna say. So the other thing to remember is in the case of both Columbine and Virginia Tech, uh, the SWAT teams actually did show up at the scene. In fact, they showed up while the shooting was still going on uh, and they determined it was too dangerous uh, for them to go inside. So the idea that we need a SWAT team to sort of apprehend people in these mass shooting situations, and believe me, I mean, I don't, I, I wouldn't go in when there's a mass shooting going on, right? Uh, but the idea that we need to have this SWAT team to prevent these situations doesn't really jive with the fact that when these situations have happened, uh, a lot of times the SWAT team uh, has not actually engaged the shooter. I will say, uh, in Newtown, Massachusetts, the SWAT team actually did go in as the shooting was happening. And the fact that they did, um, they've been credited with probably saving a lot of lives. Uh, so it's not always the case. But that was a case where you had a state police SWAT team at a state police outpost that showed up. Uh, I still don't think it's an argument for putting a SWAT team on every college campus. Yeah, I'm sorry, Connecticut, yeah, not Massachusetts. Um, so I want to talk about two kind of, uh, how much time do I have left here? About 15 more minutes. Oh, so we're, we're running right at the end, okay. Um, just a couple more very quick points. Um, uh, two more milestone moments. One comes in 1996 when California legalized medical marijuana. Uh, up until this point, um, California, uh, up until this point, the, the government, the police organizations had justified this kind of force by saying, we have to use this kind of force because of the threat we're facing, that these are dangerous people that are going to shoot at us if we try to serve warrants the conventional way. There are arguments against that. I've already made a couple, but at least they're making the argument, right? We have to use this kind of force be because it's com uh, commensurate with the threat. But California legalizes medical marijuana. You get these businesses that pop up, mom and pop shops, you know, uh, pot grows, pot dispensaries, treatment centers. Some of them were legitimate, some of them weren't, but they were all openly operating under state law. These were not underground criminal enterprises. Well, how did the federal government respond? They, they responded by sending federal SWAT teams in to raid these places. Well, you literally had cancer and AIDS patients handcuffed to their, to their beds with guns pointed at their heads. Um, these were not threats, right? The government was not using this kind of violence because of the threat it was facing. It was using violence to send a political message. Uh, these, state, these, these businesses were openly flouting federal law and the federal government was making an example of it. It's a very scary thing. I don't think there was a full sort of appreciation at the time of what was going on. You know, in free societies, we give government permission to use force and violence to protect us from threats. Uh, government using force and violence to make a political statement is not the sort of thing we normally associate with free societies. Yet that's exactly what was happening, uh, what happened and has been happening ever since. Um, the last kind of moment I want to talk about, and then I'll, I'll take questions, comes in after 2011, the September 11th attacks. Now you have the Department of Homeland Security uh, handing out grants to police departments across the country uh, to buy new military-grade equipment, ostensibly to fight terrorism. Uh, but these grants are going to places like Canyon County, Idaho, and Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, places that aren't likely to succumb to Al-Qaeda or ISIS anytime soon. Uh, and so once they have this gear, it again ends up being used in much more routine policing like serving drug warrants. Um, the, the, the DHS grants dwarf the Pentagon program. Uh, it's not even close. This is now the major source of militarization of police in the US is the DHS program. Um, there's another sort of aspect of it that's also a little discouraging, and that is that with the Pentagon program, this was surplus equipment, right? It was sitting in a warehouse somewhere. It had already been bought and paid for. The DHS grants are going to buy brand new equipment. 
Um, and so what's happened is you've had this cottage industry that sprung up solely to build this equipment in exchange for these checks from DHS. Uh, inevitably, that industry has set up lobbying shops in Washington to make sure this program continues and expands. Uh, and now you have the police industrial complex, uh, kind of the little brother to the military industrial complex, uh, which is going to make it much difficult to ever roll any of this back. Um, I'll just close by saying uh, I use the term police state in the book, or I talk about the term police state. Um, I don't you know, think we live in a police state. If we did, I would be in prison for writing this book, and you would all probably be arrested for coming to hear me talk. Um, but for a lot of people, it does feel like a police state, right? The people who, Todd Blair, for example, his one interaction uh, with police was all encompassing, all, all consuming, right? It killed him. Uh, in other cases, uh, same with Matthew David Stewart, ended up with you know, his life being over. Uh, people who have interactions with police in these kinds of situations or these contexts probably feels a lot like a police state. Uh, for the rest of us, of course, it, you don't want to wait until we actually become one to complain uh, because at, the point, at that point, uh, it's, of course, too late. Um, thank you for inviting me uh, to speak, and uh, I'd be happy to take questions. So a couple of things. I know that some people are here for classes. And uh, some of you may have to leave at 5.30. That's fine if you can just make your way out quietly. Those who are able to stay and want to, we will go till 6.00. I'd like to welcome to the stage right now Stephen Handelman, who is the director of our Center for Media, Crime, and Justice at the college, and also the host of Criminal Justice Matters, a CUNY TV show that he's going to be uh, interviewing Mr. Balco for right now. What we'll do, I think, is we'll alternate Q&A. We'll give uh, Steve one question and one to the audience. And Steve, if you want to select the audience questioners, I think that that's probably the way to do it. Or should we wait for our folks to... Exit, I guess. Well, it's actually not 5.30 yet, but uh, if you're leaving, you're leaving. Huh. <laughs> is this on? Is this on? Yeah, it is. So let's, um, let's start very quickly. For those of you um, who haven't yet read Radley's book, I really, really recommend it. It's in, hard co it's in paperback now. Um, in, in the best, it's really a troubling book. Um, some of the things that Radley's talking about, you're listening to, uh, are troubling, of course. But if you read the book, um, in the best traditions of journalism, he piles fact after fact after fact, so much so that you wonder where we've been all this time. Uh, Professor Moscos uh, mentioned the fact that he wrote it, um, it was published before Ferguson. Um, and he was probably a little bit prescient about it. But obviously, this stuff has been happening uh, for the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and it's only lately, of course, that we've more people have come to realize uh, the threat and the things that have been going on. So I, I really I want to open this up to questions. I know a lot of you have them. But I thought I would start just by asking, um, you know, are we so far along that um, have we got to the point where we really can't walk this back? Um, before I get to that, I want to uh, just address what you sort of prefaced the question with, which is the idea that we didn't know about this until recently. I mean, uh, this has been going on, as you said, since about the early 1980s, and actually even before that, but it's really when it was started being ramped up. I think the reason why a lot of us hadn't heard of it until only recently is because it was happening to uh, mostly to communities that don't have political power and don't have a voice, don't have the ability to sort of get anyone to listen to what was happening. Um, I mean, there's a period in the late 80s, early 90s where these raids were televised on national news um, and people loved it. Like it was, I talk about an incident in the book where um, I think it was the CBS Evening News uh, showed this raid on a public housing unit and uh, extraordinarily violent raid and they found a, a small quantity of pot that the woman's uh, son, teenage son had in his bedroom uh, and they sort of trumpeted as this huge success, this raid. Uh, and the woman was kicked out of public housing under a Clinton administration policy that said basically a zero tolerance policy, policy for drugs in public housing. Um, you watch it today and it's really alarming and you're like, well, all that violence for pot and they're sort of celebrating at the end of it. Um, but that's how it was viewed at the time. So I think the, you know, the idea that sort of a lot of us are just waking up to this issue now is, is you know, indicative of the fact that a lot of us aren't, the people who are just waking up now are people who are, don't belong to communities that this has been happening to for a very long time. Um, you know, it's telling that the one state, the first state to pass any kind of SWAT reform bill whatsoever was Maryland. 
uh, and they only passed that bill after a mayor of a local town was mistakenly raided. Uh, so it took you know, a member of the political class getting affected by this issue for the political class actually to take notice. Um, so getting to your question, um, uh, is it too late to walk this back? No, I, I mean, I don't think it is. I, I've actually been really encouraged by what's happened since Ferguson. Uh, I think we're seeing uh, a kind of national, you know, I, I really hate the term national discussion, but that is actually what's happening. Um, but we're also seeing sort of a consensus forming on this, uh, a, a pan-ideological consensus. Uh, even before Ferguson, I, I, I pointed out when my book came out, I was really encouraged by the fact that it was, it was warmly received sort of on the left and the right. I did a, an interview, a friendly interview with, uh, with Glenn Beck and Democracy Now! on the same afternoon. Um, so, you know, I do think that people uh, are kind of waking up. In the book I talk about how, uh, you know, uh, up until only recently, I think one reason this issue has been allowed to flourish is that when it's sort of happening to people on the right, for instance, in the 90s, there were these raids on uh, gun, gun, to enforce gun laws that were pretty violent. Uh, when it's happening to people on the right, the people on the left sort of look the other way or, or maybe even were a little gleeful. Uh, and when it's happening to people sort of normally associated with the left, the right looks the other way, it is a little bit gleeful. Uh, and I think what we've seen now is it's gotten so pervasive uh, to the fact that we're, you know, SWAT, you know, the, the federal agencies like the Department of Education now has its own tactical team. Um, it's happened it's so pervasive that it's hitting everybody, and I think now you know it's gotten bad enough that that a lot of people are. It's happening to enough people, or it's happening to enough people who know people, uh, that it's possible to build sort of a wide coalition. I do think it's going to happen happen at the state and local level, um, where we have seen reform. It's it's happened uh, very, on a very local uh, level. Congress can do some things, but can basically they can stop making it worse if they wanted to. Um, uh, as could the White House. Um, and we've seen a little bit of symbolic action so far, but nothing really substantive. Uh, but I really think if, if you want to change policies sort of in your community at your level, uh, I really do think it is possible, but it's about you know, sort of getting, getting word out and making this an issue in DA's elections and sheriff's elections and mayoral elections. Okay, so let's open it up to a few questions. I know there must be a lot of you who have questions. Do we have mics in the, um, in the aisles? Or do we need to bring, you have a walking mic? Uh, please, just say your name. Make your question as brief as you possibly can so we can fit in less people. Uh, my name is Catherine, and I, uh, my question is basically, I mean, it seems pretty clear that uh, police and the justice system in general is becoming privatized, almost like a, a business, like capitalism, with the for-profit prison system. And, I, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that that would likely increase um, everything that's been happening. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I'm opposed to private prisons. I'm particularly opposed to private prob probation. Um, I, I'm not sure it's been much of a factor in police militarization because police militarization has been going on for decades. I think the privatization trend is is, is relatively newer than that. Um, I certainly don't think it's helping matters, uh, but I also think, you know, if we if we ended all privatization in the criminal justice system tomorrow, uh, we would still have a, most of the same problems we have today. Um, now, that's, that's not a reason to support privatization, because, of course, I, I, as I said, I think the incentives are wrong, and I think privatizing components of the criminal justice system is probably going to make things worse. Uh, but I do think there is a little bit of a danger of when, when we focus too much on the privatization and we sort of make it the source of all the ill in the criminal justice system, there's a tendency to overlook the fact that there are a lot of problems that pre-existed privatization and that would exist if it were you know, ended tomorrow. Um, so, yeah, I think you're right. I think it makes, it does sort of make it worse. I think the incentives are all misaligned when you start privatizing, you know, uh, prisons, probation, parole. Um, I, you know, there's even some talk, I, there are a few small communities even trying privatizing police. Um, and I think, you know, it's probably going to make things worse, but I also think we need to also keep focus on the issues that kind of predate privatization. So you have a question over there. Raise your hands. Who else uh, has questions so I'll know in advance uh, where to look? Got one over there next, and and one there. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for your talk, Radley. Um, Jose Vasquez with the Anthropology Department here at John Jay. I just had a question in terms of the incidents of violence, uh, particularly with SWAT forces and veterans being in the military force. So that you you know you said it kind of really kicked off in the 60s and 70s when a lot of Vietnam vets were coming back. Is there any correlation between? Yep. sort of combat service and people serving in these types of units. Um, and then a comment, just I think, just I haven't read your book yet, so I, I, I'll uh, take it with a grain of salt, but I feel like in the talk, um, your 
dichotomy between military and police I found a little oversimplified, um, being a vet myself and, and just understanding how uh, military training goes and military police are trained and all of that stuff. So if you could say maybe a little bit more about how you see those, those two forces, I guess, uh, being somewhat different. Well, I mean, I, I do think the two, the two institutions are kind of converging. Like I said, I think the, the military is increasingly asked to be sort of a peacemaker or police force in, in many parts of the world. And I think the police are becoming increasingly militarized. I think my point is just that the, in the ideal, um, they should be two very, very different institutions with two very, very different functions. Um, whether or not that's, you know, I, uh, what's actually happening, I think, the fact that that isn't happening, I think, is part of the problem. Um, I will say that uh, your, your question about veterans and, and pe uh, people with military experience in policing is a really interesting one. And it's one that before I started writing the book, I, I kind of just assumed that that was part of the problem. Uh, and I've gotten kind of mixed results when I've talked to police chiefs, uh, particularly sort of the older guys who, who are concerned about militarization, and I ask them this question about veterans and, and police forces. Uh, and maybe this is just a sign of sort of how bad things have gotten, but a lot of them say the veterans are actually a good influence on the rogue cops because, you know, in the military there is a kind of ingrained sense of personal responsibility. There's a very strict uh, uh, rules of engagement, even though those rules of engagement aren't uh, aren't applicable or shouldn't be applicable to domestic policing. They are at least familiar with the idea of rules of engagement. Um, there are, you know, after action reports. Uh, and so a lot of police chiefs told me they actually found the veterans to be sort of a good influence. Now that, that wasn't universal. There were other police chiefs who said, you know, who did think it was a problem. There's also, you know, problems with PTSD, obviously, that you have to screen for. Um, so I'm not, you know, I, I, I don't have a, a satisfying sort of black or white answer to that. I mean, I think it's kind of, it, from what I can tell, and sort of in my reporting and research, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, I have heard from other sort of veterans, particularly people who train raid teams in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, that they're sort of repulsed by what they see in some of these SWAT videos that sort of tactically they're, they're error prone and are like, basically more likely to make things more dangerous rather than more safe. And then also just from kind of a human rights perspective, now I don't know, you know, how, how much, you know, I, for instance, I had one guy from who trained uh, raid teams in Afghanistan who watched uh, the Jose Guarena video, which is this raid in, in uh, um, Arizona where this veteran was, was killed during a drug raid. Uh, and there's a video of it and he watched the video and, you know, he said basically if that happened in the military, you know, every one of those officers would be court-martialed. You know, I can only take his word for it. I don't know if that's true or not, but I have had lots, several members of the military who sort of work on these teams who have told me after the talk or in emails that, um, you know, they're, they're very upset by what they see in some of these SWAT videos. Just to follow up on that, I assume a lot of cops have read your book. What's been the reaction you've gotten? Um, I, I kind of found there's a generational split. Um, I think I've found older cops tend to sort of agree with me. I mean, you know, they may have quibbles with per certain parts of the book or certain parts of what I say. Um, younger cops, I would say, pretty pretty uniformly don't like me <laughs> um, and don't agree with me. Um, there are some exceptions, but um, but yeah, there's there, there's definitely kind of a generational split that I've noticed. Okay, what have you got? We had a question right out front. We still, someone raised their hand right here before? Maybe not. Okay, let's go to that gentleman over there and then over, then over here, Dolores. Oh, you're... Do so you, you want to go with it? Yeah. If, if, if we can just get Dolores for a quick question, then we'll go back to you. Sorry. Thank you so much for your presentation and for your candor. I teach a class called The Law and Politics of Race Relations, and it was um, refreshing to hear you admit that part of this is because there was a desire to make white people afraid of black crime. Can you talk to us a little bit about the evidence that supports your claim? Oh sure. Well, there. I mean, there have been interviews with with Nixon administration officials uh, since then, where they just sort of flat out admitted um, that this was a very kind of cynical political ploy. That the, I mean, uh, it got to the point where they were even uh, uh, before the 1972 election, they had evidence that crime was uh, improving in D.C. Uh, pretty dramatically, actually, and it was the result of uh, a policy that Nixon. Uh, supported and funded, but didn't want anyone to, to know he supported and funded, which was drug treatment. Uh, he was, there was federally funded drug treatment that he was administering, and it was working. Uh, but that didn't, white people didn't want to hear about the federal government spending money on, you know, black drug addicts. Uh, so they actually suppressed all of that data until after the election and, and sort of hyped up the idea of, of, you know, that crime was getting worse in D.C. and, you know, 
there was a, the, the media sort of played along very complacently. There was a, um, a great New York Times article about you know someone who was sort of walking in the shadow of the Washington Monument, you know, when they were shot, gunned down, you know, by a drug dealer. Um, so, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I think if you read, um, uh, I think the, the the best history of the drug war is a book called Smoke and Mirrors by Dan Baum. It came, it's about 20 years old now, but um, up until, you know, 94, 95 when it was published, it's a really thorough, uh, you know, uh, accounting of sort of how, how we got here. And it really, he interviewed a lot of officials in the Nixon, Nixon administration who, you know, 15, 20 years later, basically just flat out admitted to a lot of this stuff. Thanks for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask, you, oh yeah, sure. You said that this was um, at least partly about making whites afraid of black crime, but uh, the militarization of the police force and these uh, localized policing tactics go pretty far back. I mean, Red Summer involved actual police for uh, actual military forces in the US. The military denied it, that they were directing them, but they admitted that they were military forces directed against black neighborhoods. We saw this kind of uh, directed policing against black neighborhoods in the 1960s, the 1970s. And I know you were going to talk about civil forfeiture, but it's a way of economically suppressing these neighborhoods. Um, do you think, and I tend to think that partly this is not just creating votes or creating wedge issues, but also economically suppressing certain groups, particularly African-American neighborhoods. Uh, I'm wondering if you're alighting that or if that's something that you see as part of this, that this is actually uh, an act of racism and not simply using racism as a, a means to gain votes. Um, I don't, I mean, I, I don't know that I, I mean, I can only sort of form conclusions based on what I have evidence for. And I mean, you're, you're sort of asking me to divine motives for this. And I don't, you know, I don't know, I don't know what the policymakers are thinking. I mean, I don't know what people have been thinking on an individual, law enforcement leaders have been thinking on an individual or local level. Um, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm certain, I'm, I'm sure that that's, that's probably part of it in some areas. Uh, I don't know. Uh, again, I don't, all I can say is that these policies and these actions have disproportionately affected communities of color. You know, why, they, why they've been directed that way, you know, a law and order type would say, well, that's where the crime is, right? Um, but, you know, why is that where the crime is? And that's, you know, that's the other question. Um, so, again, I don't, I, I can't, you know, I don't have evidence as to why it happened. All I can say is that that's how it happened. Just um, behind you. I have. Oh, can, I, can I go first? Thank you. Um, I actually came across the river. I'm with the criminal justice department in Jersey City, New Jersey City University. So I'm very glad I can come here to listen to this talk. So my question is, I'm curious to know your idea about, you know, the influence from politics in the police strategy, because we know that a lot of the police practices, they're actually driven by federal grants, and it's been really powerful. And one of the examples I see is, for example, the school resource officers, they've been provided with funds from the federal governments, and you see it's proliferating across the country. So are you aware of any federal efforts that's been put out for either slowing this process down or kind of controlling it and we're reducing it so we can gear toward you know another direction because we are aware of the effects and people are starting to talk about it so is there anything that you know about that's from the up top that's out there yeah. well, first let me just I'm gonna use your question to just emphasize that I, I, I you know, the, the the talk itself is kind of hard on individual police officers and clearly there are rogue you know cops out there and and bad cops and good cops but I really think Focusing on cops themselves is sort of, uh, it doesn't really sort of help the discussion. I mean, this, the, these problems are at a policy level, um, and, you know, you can feed the best, most conscientious people into a bad system loaded with bad incentives, and you're going to continue to get bad results, right? The good people are going to leave, or they're going to be frustrated. Um, and so it really is at the policy level, so I'm glad you, you've asked this question. Um, I, I, there hasn't been a lot of activity. I mean, the Obama administration has... Uh, put some limits on the 1033 program. This, this is the, the, the Pentagon program of giving the surplus stuff away. It's largely symbolic. It's not really going to make a dent, um, mostly because the 1033 program isn't really even the source of this equipment anymore. Most of it's coming from DHS and actually from private donors uh, uh, and from police departments just buying it, buying this stuff on their own. Um, 
You know, there are things Congress could do, though. These burn grants that are going to fund uh, multi-jurisdictional drug task forces. I and mean, these are drug task forces that are funded with, with federal money and asset forfeiture money. They're basically self-funded. Uh, and they don't report really to anyone. Um, there's no local official that they report to. In fact, in Missouri, there was a, 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 drug, a drug activist, uh, drug legalization activist who tried to uh, FOIA uh, the, just any documents from one of these task forces, actually all of them across the state. And he's got these surreal phone conversations where he'll call them and say, you know, I'm trying to submit this records request to the state of Missouri. And they'll say, well, we're a federal agency. We're not subject to state law. And then he'll say, well, then I'm going to submit a FOIA. And they'll say, well, we're a state agency. We're not subject to FOIA. Um, so they, they straddle this sort of nether region between state and federal, which makes them like completely, you know, void of any sort of accountability. Um, and Congress could end that program tomorrow by ending the burn grant program and, and basically forcing, you know, they might be able to survive on asset forfeiture alone, but it would certainly put a huge dent in it. Um, other things they could, you know, the federal government could do, I mean, they could end the federal drug war. <laughs> yeah. You know, that would be a huge, uh, uh, and, and sort of let states make their own drug laws. Uh, that's not gonna happen anytime soon. Um, but uh, the other thing that, you know, that Congress could do, uh, police departments get a ton of money from the federal government. Uh, you could start, you know, attaching strings to this, uh, to, the, to that money. You could say, all right, if you're gonna get money from the federal government, then we need, we want more transparency. We wanna know how many police officers fire their weapons in, from your department over the course of the year. We wanna know how many times you deploy your SWAT team, what for, what was found, whether any shots were fired. Um, so you could start at least sort of imposing some transparency. I mean, part of the problem I found in researching the book is there's just not a lot of data out there. Uh, Professor Kraska's figures, you know, are, basically estimates based on surveys, which the most recent of which was done in 2005. Uh, the ACLU did a study, you know, came out right after the book, uh, after my book, but you know, it was, it, it was also based on survey data. Um, the only states that we've seen where we have any kind of hard data was Maryland, which passed this bill I talked about earlier, uh, and Utah, which just passed a bill last year. Uh, the Maryland bill's already expired, it wasn't renewed, unfortunately. But what we found in Maryland, for example, is that there were an average of four and a half SWAT deployment SWAT raids per day in the state of Maryland, and uh, the vast, vast majority of them, I think it was 80%, were for what the FBI, or misdemeanors and what the FBI calls non-serious felonies, so pretty low-level crimes. Um, and that's similar to what we found in Utah also, that uh, most of these raids are to serve warrants on people suspected. And again, I, I didn't, I don't think I, I didn't kind of have time to make this distinction apparent in the main talk, but this switch, I mean, SWAT teams were intended to, to use overwhelming force and violence to defuse an already violent situation. Today, they're primarily used to serve warrants on people, uh, which means you're creating violence and confrontation. You're breaking into their house in the middle of the night where there was none before. Um, where they used to be used to confront someone who was in the process of committing a violent crime, you know, an active shooter or a hostage taker, today they're primarily used to serve warrants to investigate people who are still suspected of nonviolent consensual crimes. I mean, it's a, it's a really dramatic use in how this kind of force is used. And, you know, it, it, because it happened fairly gradually, there was never any real sort of discussion or debate over whether this is appropriate. Um, and, you know, I think there are things that can be done at the federal level, uh, certainly to sort of stop the bleeding and, and to prevent things from getting worse. Uh, but as I said before, I think most of the reform, if it's going to happen, is probably going to have to come from the bottom up. What changes did President Obama make to the DHS grant program for military equipment, the police organization? Um, there were a number of them. Um, one, you know, they, they, I think there's a ban now on really serious equipment like grenade launchers and, uh, you know, machine, automatic machine guns. Well, actually, actually, I don't even think the military uses automatic machine guns. Uh, 50 caliber, anything that shoots 50 caliber ammunition, you can no longer get from the federal government, which the fact that you once could is absurd. Um, uh, and actually, one thing they did that I thought was 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 encouraging was they they prohibited any camouflage gear from being transferred to local police departments, which to me suggests that they understand at least that this is more about more than just the guns and the gear. It's it's about the mindset. Um, and actually, I mean, most of what Obama does has done I think is sort of symbolic. Um, very little sub substantive uh, in the way of substantive policy that's really going to change much. However, I mean. The, the symbolism is really big and important. I mean, for the first time, uh, you know, in, in, you know, since I've been alive, we have a president who has said, you know, not that we need 
the cops to be more aggressive and, and you know, fight crime harder and take it to the criminals. We have a president who's saying, for the first time, maybe we've gone too far and maybe we need to sort of reassess and reevaluate. And I mean, that in itself was pretty important. I mean, it would be great if it resulted in actual <laughs> substantive policy. Um, but that is, it does at least sort of mark a shift kind of in the momentum uh, and, you know, we'll see what we can do from there. We have a question right here, uh, one up there, and then one behind it. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk, and I really enjoyed reading your book. I got it um, about a year ago, and it took me a while to read it, but it, it's definitely very interesting. Um, I'm a community health major, and in particularly um, how it relates to, to substance use. And so this is kind of an ancillary interest of mine. But say, you know, especially now that we have some, you know, organizations saying that decriminalization of drugs is a good thing for the public health and um, treatment and, and stuff like that should be the goal, what are these guys going to do if that ever happens? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, you know, I mean, a SWAT team is sort of a government in entity like any other. They're, they're always going to try to find a, a justification for their existence. And, and um, you know, there's a fascinating uh, online forum I found a few years ago that has since disappeared into the ether. But um, there was an, a news article. It was really, really fascinating and terrifying. Uh, there was a news article about this new sort of fungus they were developing that could eat coca plants, right? And and nothing else. It would just eat coca plants. And I don't think it, I think it was, you know, somebody probably jumped on the story too early and it never never came to fruition. But there was this news story out there. And uh, there, was this, there was this thread, uh, online thread, where DEA agents could sort of anonymously chat amongst themselves and somebody sent it to them. And so somebody had posted this article and they were absolutely terrified of this fungus, right? Because if, it, if all the coca plants get eaten up, then they don't have jobs anymore, right? And it got to the point where one of them suggested that this is this is why um, this is why that they, they should all lobby for uh, very strict abortion laws because if there's no more cocaine, you know they're going to have to do something so they can you know to start raiding you know abortion you know back alley abortion clinics or whatever. I mean it was just it was mind blowing to sort of see the mindset in action. Um, look, I mean. You know, I think if, if the drug war ended tomorrow, the federal drug war ended tomorrow, uh, if states, more states sort of follow the lead of Colorado and Washington, Oregon, um, you know, there's going to be a lot less use for SWAT teams. Now, I will say, you know, there, there, are, there is mission creep going on. Um, you know, a year before Ferguson, uh, there was a story out of St. Louis County uh, where a SWAT team was used to serve an administrative warrant uh, for a white collar crime. And uh, the neighbors were very concerned. They called the local media, uh, a local news station, went to the St. Louis Police Department. Again, this is a year before Ferguson. Said, you know, what's the deal? Why was this SWAT team deployed for this, this white collar crime? And a spokesman for the St. Louis Police Department responded that in St. Louis County now, all search warrants are served with the SWAT team, regardless of the crime. Um, that's pretty scary stuff. And, and I've since found it's not just St. Louis, but any felony is now served the SWAT team uh, in a lot of jurisdictions. So, you know, they are sort of, it is moving beyond the, the drug war. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not everywhere, uh, but it's certainly in, you know, an alarming number of places we're seeing. I mean, I've written about, you know, SWAT teams deployed to enforce zoning laws and co uh, code violations. Uh, there have been SWAT raids on fraternities and bars where police suspected there was underage drinking going on. Um, so, you know, there is, we're, we are seeing it move, move out and beyond the drug war. How's it going? Uh, quick question before I get into what I wanted to say. The question you asked earlier uh, bef uh, at the beginning of this Q&A, you asked how we can backtrack, if we can go back. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on what exactly you're asking with that question? You want me to answer that? Yes. <laughs> so I guess what I was asking is, can we get back to where we were uh, in, not, I guess in the 50s or 60s, but in the time when Police officers acted like police officers and not soldiers. That's what I was really getting at. Okay. So I just wanted to address something that I feel has not been really addressed, or, or at least extensively, is the fact that the police are doing exactly what they were designed to do. Uh, if, if you look at the slave codes and how the original police force that were enacted here in the United States were to uh, look for runaway slaves and bring them back to the plantations, 
uh, if you look at the police force, they're doing exactly what they're designed to do. So there's no way we can go back to anything because there's nothing to go back to. So what should happen is not a reform of the police or, or, or the criminal justice system, but a reconstruction of it. We got to destroy whatever it is now and reconstruct it to a point where it works for the people the, the way, you know, it's what they want you to believe it was intended to do. Um, another thing I wanted to, to, to ask is, as I, by the way, I'm a student here at John Jay. Uh, I don't hear anything as far as what we can do from a student level uh, as far as making changes. What, what would you suggest students can do? Mm -hmm. uh, because I feel like students are the, the largest voice in this country and we have a lot of power that we don't really use to the best of our ability. And I want to know what, from you who, who is a little bit more experienced, what would you suggest the students do to make a change, not, a, not uh, to re help reconstruct the, the, the justice system? Um, wow. Um, well, so as to your first point, I think it's very well taken. I mean, I think there is a little bit of a, um, a, a tendency to idealize uh, the past. I mean, you know, Officer Friendly is kind of the vision of the police we have in the 1950s, but, you know, Officer Friendly was uh, enforcing, you know, segregation laws and, uh, you know, there's, there's, so I, yeah, I think there is a danger of that. I mean, I think things have gotten worse in a lot of ways. Um, I've, I've, I guess the way I try to, to explain it is I think the, there are a few kind of rogue officers who kind of act out beyond policy. Um, and those who do, there are at least some attempts at kind of holding them accountable with internal affairs departments and so forth. The scary thing is that the, the amount of force that is allowed to be used as sort of a matter of policy that's allowed by policy uh, has grown dramatically, which, which I think is, is pretty frightening. But I, your point's well taken. I, mean, I, I do think we have to be careful about saying uh, there was a time when things were, were wonderful and we need to go back to that time. Uh, as for what, what students can do, um, I mean, one thing I recommend that, that anyone can do uh, is it's very easy to file an open records request. Um, and I think information is, is pretty powerful just in and of itself. So for example, uh, you know, your local police department, your local sheriff's department, um, you know, there are, uh, I think the Student Press Law Center actually has a form you can just fill out where you just put in your city, your state, what you're looking for. Uh, and they'll generate a, a, a letter that complies with your state open records law. And you can ask, uh, how many times has the SWAT team been deployed in the last five years? What was found? Why were they deployed? You know, were any shots fired? Uh, and then, you know, you can write it up yourself, uh, publish it somewhere. You can send it to a local journalist. You can say, hey, look, you know, SWAT team was deployed 60 times last year, you know, primarily in, uh, you know, African-American zip codes, uh, only eight of those raids produced any drugs at all and none of them produced felony charges. So, you know, why are we sending our SWAT teams uh, on these extraordinary raids that aren't really actually doing anything and aren't turning anything up and terrorizing people for no reason? Um, so that's something anybody can do. Anybody can file an open records request. You don't have to be, you know, a journalist or a member of government. Um, you know, beyond that, uh, uh, you know, it's sort of, I guess, what tack do you want to take? Um, you can... Uh, you know, I think one area where the criminal justice reform movement could be a lot better uh, is, is getting politically active. Um, I think, you know, protest is, is good and important and, and consciousness uh, uh, raising, but, you know, DA, district attorney's races, sheriff's races, nobody really pays attention to them, which means they're pretty easy to influence. Um, if you can give people a reason not to vote for someone, um, uh, you can have a pretty big impact pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, making these, you know, the, the last mayoral election in New York is a great example of this. I mean, stop and frisk uh, became an issue because people made it an issue, because activists made it an issue. And, it, you know, it's a big reason why de Blasio was elected. Um, now, I, you know, I, we can look at the results from that and decide whether that, how, how effective that activism actually was. But uh, the point is, is that, you know, for the first time in a long time in a major city, you know, policing was a factor in a mayoral election. And I think that's because you know, people made themselves heard and, and, and forced that to happen. Uh, and that can happen anywhere. I mean, city council races, uh, you can ask, you know, what what kind of police chief should we have? Do we want a aggressive, non, you know, aggressive, confrontational sort of war on crime police chief, or do we want somebody who, 
uh, takes a more community-oriented approach to policing. Uh, you know, force mayoral candidates to talk about this stuff. Um, so those are, I guess, two ideas uh, going forward. Uh, John Kleinig, um, I'd like to get your reaction to an argument that I've heard for police uh, militarizing themselves. And it goes something like this. The 1033 program provided us with free equipment. If it should happen that in our neighborhood uh, something occurs that would not have occurred had, had we had the 1033 equipment, we'll be held to blame for it. Yeah. So we better get this equipment just in case. Yeah, and I mean, you can always sort of make that argument. You can say, you know, if, if not for this, this would have happened. Um, I think the argument would have a lot more merit if that's, if those kinds of situations is how that equipment was being used primarily. If, you know, we weren't seeing the, the armored personnel carrier rolled out uh, in any situations other than situations where there's like a barricade or shots were fired. Um, but the fact is, you know, we see this stuff over and over again used, again, to serve warrants on people suspected of pretty low-level crimes. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's, it's a hard argument to sort of refute because it seems like every police agency can point to sort of one incident in the last 10 years where if we didn't have this armor personnel carrier, um, you know, who knows what would have happened. Um, and counterfactuals are always difficult to sort of argue against. But, um, look, I would just say, you know, there was a, 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 town, a little town in New Hampshire that fought uh, uh, the acquisition of one of these armored personnel carriers. And uh, I remember interviewing uh, one of the women who was fighting against it, and she wasn't really activist-oriented at all. Uh, and I said, you know, what, what, what made you sort of so angry about this that, that you would sort of protest against the acquisition of this vehicle? Uh, and she said, she said, I don't want to live in a town where I, I look out the window and I see a military vehicle in front of City Hall. She's like, that's just not the kind of town I want to be. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think there are very practical sort of uh, concerns in terms of, of public safety, and you, you can point to the sort of trail of bodies that a lot of these raids have led to. Uh, but I also just think imagery is, is also important. I think, you know, part of it is just kind of what, what sort of society do we want to live in? Do we want to live in one where police officers, you know, have faces and name tags and, you know, wear police blues and engage in sort of the community and are part of the community? Or do we want to live in one where they wear camouflage and face masks and, you know, sort of tote huge guns. I mean, um, that I think is, a, is also a big part of the question that probably gets overlooked a lot. Just to follow up on that question and the one before that, I mean, we often forget that none of this really could have happened to the extent it has without it, the enabling that comes from judges and prosecutors and politicians. And in order to change that, many of them are motivated by just that, the fear that if we don't do something, we're gonna get knocked when something does happen. Mm. Um, so it's really, it's a systemic issue right. rather than just the cops are, are becoming warriors. Yeah, and, I, and I think the only way you counter that is you, you provide an incentive for them to do the right thing, right? I mean, if, if a prosecutor or a sheriff knows that if they sign off on, you know, a warrant that leads to a, a innocent family getting terrorized, that that's going to hurt them politically, um, then they're going to be a hell of a lot more careful before they sign off on those warrants. Uh, the problem is, right now, that isn't a factor. They don't. That's not something they have to worry about. Um, I mean, these botched raids happen. You know, I wouldn't say they happen all the time, but they happen fairly frequently, and there are almost no consequences. You know, when they do, um, you know, judges are a huge part of this. I mean, I write about this in the book. There, there are judges. There's a uh, been. Too few, if anybody's looking for academic work, this would be a great topic, by the way. Uh, there's too, too, too few studies into this, but I, I would love to see somebody do a thorough study into how judges um, uh, sort of consider and approve search warrants, because my guess is that they get almost no scrutiny at all, and what data there is out there suggests that that's the case, um, that you know, 99% or more search warrants are, are probably approved, signed off. Um, one of the studies that is out there that I cite in the book was in Colorado after a botched raid and killed this guy, Ishmael Mena, who was completely innocent, an fa immigrant father of 10, was gunned down in his own home. Um, and there was a study done of, of no-knock warrants uh, in uh, Denver and the surrounding county over the past four or five years. Uh, what they found was that mo I think it was 95-plus uh, percent of, these, of the no-knock warrants were approved. But in Colorado, you actually have, the police actually have to, a no knock, there's a, there's a higher hurdle to get a no knock warrant as opposed to a knock and announce. And they found several cases where the judges approved a no knock warrant even though the police didn't even ask for one. 
Um, and when they interviewed the, the head of the, sort of the head of judges for, for Denver, the judge basically said, well, you know, we sign so many warrants every day that like you can't expect us to, you know, sort of know where we're signing on the form every time. I mean, it was it was such a just sort of callous, you know, approach to, the, to this issue that like actually lives hang in the balance. Um, uh, you know, unfortunately, most judges, that's not an issue that, you know, I, most judges aren't elected and of, of those who are, you know, that never comes up. Um, but I would, it would be fascinating to see some, you know, some thorough studies on uh, how judges consider search warrants, how many, you know, what percentage are approved, you know, what, which, if any, judges give them any scrutiny at all. We have time for one last question. Uh, given the issues with accountability, and um, the lack of oversight, what are your thoughts on the phenomenon known as swatting, where people call in hoax, hoax kidnappings and other such events intending for the SWAT teams to come in and raid? Yeah, I mean, uh, in some ways, it's just kind of a sign of the times, right? When every, every small town has a SWAT team, it becomes much easier to sort of manipulate them. But yeah, this phenomenon where somebody, you know, people who are sort of somewhat tech savvy can sort of disguise their phone numbers and, you know, call, there was a case of a, a prosecutor in Los Angeles County, this happened to, who was sort of a nemesis of mine actually, but he uh, um, was swatted. Somebody called the LAPD claiming, and was able to sort of spoof his phone number and said basically, I just, something like, I just shot my wife, uh, and they sent a SWAT team. And you know, the guy could have been killed from this. Um, you know, I don't. I, I think it's it's partly just a sign of, of how ubiquitous SWAT teams are that it's so easy to do this now. Um, you know, you can't really blame the police department for this though, because in most cases, the the complaint is of some sort of imminent threat, imminent danger, um, and you know that's that's what SWAT teams are for to respond to these sort of active, active, you know, violent crimes in progress, and that's usually how it's framed to them. Um, so yeah, it's. I mean, it's a troubling phenomenon. You know, I don't know that it's. All that common. I mean, you know, any time it happens, it's pretty awful because someone could could literally be killed. Um, but uh, I, it's hard to sort of blame. I think the police agency in those cases. So I want to recommend you once again that if you haven't read this book, really take a look at it. Really repays some time. And please join me in thanking Radley for a fantastic talk. Thanks for having me out.